One, questions. One dot one. Consciousness, the phenomenal self, and the first person perspective. This is a book about consciousness, the phenomenal self, and the first person perspective. Its main thesis is that no such things as selves exist in the world. Nobody ever was or had a self. All that ever existed were conscious self models that could not be recognized as models. The phenomenal self is not a thing, but a process. And the subjective experience of being someone emerges if a conscious information processing system operates under a transparent self model. You are such a system right now as you read these sentences, because you cannot recognize your self model as a model. It is transparent. You look right through it. You don't see it, but you see with it. In other more metaphorical words, the central claim of this book is that as you read these lines, you constantly confuse yourself with the content of the self model currently activated by your brain. This is not your fault. Evolution has made you this way. On the contrary, arguably until now, the conscious self model of human beings is the best invention mother nature has made. It is a wonderfully efficient two-way window that allows an organism to conceive of itself as a whole and thereby to causally interact with its inner and outer environment in an entirely new, integrated, and intelligent manner. Consciousness, the phenomenal self, and the first person perspective are fascinating representational phenomena that have a long evolutionary history, a history which eventually led to the formation of complex societies and a cultural embedding of conscious experience itself. For many researchers in the cognitive neurosciences, it is now clear that the first person perspective somehow must have been the decisive link in this transition from biological to cultural evolution. In philosophical quarters, on the other hand, it is popular to say things like, the first person perspective cannot be reduced to the third person perspective, or to develop complex technical arguments showing that some kinds of irreducible first person facts exist. But nobody ever asks what a first person perspective is in the first place. This is what I will do. I will offer a representationalist and a functionalist analysis of what a consciously experienced first person perspective is. This book is also, and in a number of ways, an experiment. You will find conceptual toolkits and new metaphors, case studies of unusual states of mind, as well as multi-level constraints for a comprehensive theory of consciousness. You will find many well-known questions and some preliminary, perhaps even some new answers. On the following pages, I try to build a better bridge, a bridge connecting the humanities and the empirical sciences of the mind more directly. The toolkits and the metaphors, the case studies and the constraints are the very first building blocks for this bridge. What I'm interested in is finding conceptually convincing links between subpersonal and personal levels of description, links that at the same time are empirically plausible. What precisely is the point at which objective third person approaches to the human mind can be integrated with first person, subjective, and purely theoretical approaches? How exactly does strong consciously experienced subjectivity emerge out of objective events in the natural world? Today, I believe this is what we need to know more than anything else. The epistemic goal of this book consists in finding out whether conscious experience, in particular the experience of being someone, resulting from the emergence of the phenomenal self, can be convincingly analyzed on subpersonal levels of description. A related second goal consists in finding out if and how our Cartesian intuitions, those deeply entrenched intuitions that tell us that the above mentioned experience of being a subject and a rational individual can never be naturalized or reductively explained, are ultimately rooted in the deeper representational structure of our conscious minds. Intuitions have to be taken seriously, but it is also possible that our best theories about our own minds will turn out to be radically counterintuitive, that they will present us with a new kind of self-knowledge that most of us just cannot believe. 
Yes, one can certainly look at the current explosion in the mind sciences as a new and breathtaking phase in the pursuit of an old philosophical ideal, the ideal of self-knowledge. And yes, nobody ever said that a fundamental, a fundamental expansion of knowledge about ourselves necessarily has to be intuitively plausible. But if we want it to be a philosophically interesting growth of knowledge, and one that can also be culturally integrated, then we should at least demand an understanding of why. Inevitably, it is counterintuitive in some of its aspects. And this problem cannot be solved by any single discipline alone. In order to make progress with regard to the two general epistemic goals just named, we need a better bridge between the humanities and cognitive neuroscience. This is one reason why this book is an experiment, an experiment in interdisciplinary philosophy. In the now flowering interdisciplinary field of research on consciousness, there are two rather extreme ways of avoiding the problem. One is the attempt to proceed in a highly pragmatic way, simply generating empirical data without ever getting clear about what the explanandum of such an enterprise actually is. The explanandum is that which is to be explained. To give an example, in an important and now classic paper, Francis, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch introduced the idea of a, quote, neural correlate of consciousness, end quote. They wrote research programs, I'm oh, sorry, rather, they wrote, everyone has a rough idea of what is meant by consciousness. We feel that it is better to avoid a precise definition of consciousness because of the dangers of premature definition. Until we understand the problem much better, any attempt at a formal definition is likely to be either misleading or overly restrictive or both. There are certainly a number of good points behind their strategy, this strategy. In complex domains, as historical experience shows, scientific breakthroughs are frequently achieved simply by stumbling onto highly relevant data, rather than by carrying out rigorously systematized research programs. Insight often comes as a surprise. From a purely heuristic perspective, narrowing down the scope of one's search too early certainly is dangerous. For instance, by attempts by making attempts at excessive but not yet data-driven formal modeling. A certain degree of open-mindedness is necessary. On the other hand, it is simply not true that everyone has a rough idea of what the term consciousness refers to. In my own experience, for example, the most frequent misunderstanding lies in confusing the phenomenal experience as such with what philosophers call reflexive self-consciousness, the actualized capacity to cognitively refer to yourself using some sort of concept-like or quasi-linguistic kind of mental structure. According to this definition, hardly anything on this planet, including many humans during most of their day, is ever conscious at all. Second, in many languages on this planet, we do not even find an adequate counterpart for the English term consciousness. Why do all these linguistic communities obviously not see the need for developing a unitary concept of their own? Is it possible that the phenomenon did not exist for these communities? And third, it should simply be embarrassing for any scientist to not be able to clearly state what it is that she is trying to explain. What is the explanandum? What are the actual entities between which an explanatory relationship is to be established? Especially when pressed by the humanities, hard scientists should be at least able to state clearly what it is they want to know, what the target of their research is, and what from their perspective would count as a successful explanation. The other extreme is something that is frequently found in philosophy, particularly in the best of philosophy of mind. I call it analytical scholasticism. It consists in an equally dangerous tendency toward arrogant armchair theorizing. At the same time, ignoring first-person phenomenological as well as third-person empirical constraints in the formation of one's basic conceptual tools. In extreme cases, the target domain is treated as if it consisted only of analysanda and not of explananda and analysanda. What is an analysandum? An analysandum is a certain way of speaking about a phenomenon, a way that creates logical and intuitive problems. If consciousness and subjectivity were only an alisanda, then we could solve all the philosophical puzzles related to consciousness, the phenomenal self, and the first-person perspective by changing the way we talk, 
we would have to do modal logic and formal semantics and not cognitive neuroscience. Philosophy would be a fundamentalist discipline that could not, I'm sorry, that could decide on the truth and falsity of empirical statements by logical argument alone. I just cannot believe that this should be so. Certainly by the, far the best contributions to philosophy of mind in the last century have come from analytical philosophers, philosophers in the tradition of Frege and Wittgenstein, because many such philosophers are superb at analyzing the deeper structure of language, they often fall into the trap of analyzing the conscious mind as if it were itself a linguistic entity based not on dynamical self-organization in the human brain, but on a disembodied system of rule-based information processing. At least they frequently assume that there is a content level in the human mind that can be investigated without knowing anything about vehicle properties, about properties of the actual physical carriers of conscious content. The vehicle content distinction from mental representations certainly is a powerful tool in many theoretical contexts, but our best and empirically plausible theories of representation, those now so successfully employed in connectionist and dynamicist models of cognitive functioning, show that any philosophical theory of mind treating vehicle and content as anything more than two strongly interrelated aspects of one and the same phenomenon simply deprives itself of much of its explanatory power, if not of its realism and epistemological rationality. The resulting terminologies then are of little relevance to researchers in other fields, as some of their basic assumptions immediately appear ridiculously implausible from an empirical point of view. Because many analytical philosophers are ex excellent logicians, they also have a tendency to get technical, even if there is not yet a point to it, even if there are not yet any data to fill their conceptual structures with content and anchor them in the real world growth of knowledge. Epistemic progress in the real world is something that is achieved by all disciplines together. However, the deeper motive behind falling into the other extreme, the isolationist extreme of sterility and scholasticism, may really be something else. Frequently, it may actually be an unacknowledged respect for the rigor, the seriousness, and the true intellectual substance perceived in the hard sciences of the mind. Interestingly, in speaking and listening not only to philosophers, but to a number of eminent neuroscientists as well, I've often discovered a motivational mirror image. As it turns out, many neuroscientists are actually much more philosophers than they would like to admit. The same motivational structure, the same sense of respect, exists in empirical investigators avoiding precise definitions. They know too well that deeper methodological and metatheoretical issues exist, and that these issues are important and extremely difficult at the same time. The lesson to be drawn from this situation seems to be simple and clear. Somehow, the good aspects of both extremes have to be united. And because there already is a deep, if sometimes unadmitted, mutual respect between the disciplines, between the hard sciences and of the mind and the, the humanities, I believe that the chances for building more direct bridges are actually better than some of us think. As many authors have noted, what is needed is a middle course of a yet-to-be-discovered nature. I have tried to steer such a middle course in this book, and I have paid a high price for it, as readers will soon begin to notice. The treatment of philosophical issues will strike all philosophers as much too brief and quite superficial. On the other hand, my selection of empirical constraints, of case studies, and of isolated data points must strike neuro and cognitive scientists alike as often idiosyncratic and quite badly informed. Yet bridges begin with small stones, and there are only so many stones an individual person can carry. My goal, therefore, is rather modest. If at least some of the bits and pieces here assembled are useful to some of my readers, then this will be enough. As everybody knows, the problem of consciousness has gained the increasing attention of philosophers, as well as researchers working in the neuro and cognitive sciences. During the last three decades of the 20th century, we have witnessed a true renaissance. As many have argued, consciousness is the most fascinating research target conceivable, the greatest remaining challenge to the scientific worldview, as well as the centerpiece of, centerpiece of any philosophical theory of mind. What is, what is it that really that makes consciousness such a special target phenomenon? In conscious experience, a reality is present. But what does it mean to say that? For all beings enjoying conscious experience, necessarily a world appears. It means at least three different things. In conscious experience, there is a world, there is a self, and there is a relation between both. Because an interesting sense 
In an interesting sense, this world appears to the experiencing self. We can therefore distinguish three different aspects of our original question. The first set of questions is about what it means that a reality appears. The second set is about how it can be that this reality appears to someone, to a subject of experience. The third set is about how this subject becomes the center of its own world, how it transforms the appearance of a reality into a truly subjective phenomenon by tying it to an individual first-person perspective. I've said a lot about the problem of consciousness as such amounts to elsewhere. The deeper and more specific problem of how one's own personal identity appears in conscious experience and how one develops an inward subjective perspective, not only toward the external world as such, but also to other persons in it and the ongoing internal process of experience itself, its experience itself is what concerns us here. Let us therefore look at the second set of issues. For human beings, during the ongoing process of conscious experience characterizing their waking and dreaming life, a self is present. Human beings consciously experience themselves as being someone. The conscious experience of being someone, however, has many different aspects, bodily, emotional, and cognitive. In philosophy, as well as in cognitive neuroscience, we have recently witnessed a lot of excellent work focusing on bodily self-experience. See, for example, Bermudez, Bar Marcel, and Ilan, 1995, on emotional self-consciousness, or for example, Demacia, 1994, 2000, and on the intricacies involved in cognitive self-reference and the conscious experience of being an embodied thinking self, see Nagel, 1986, Bermudez, 1998. What does it mean to say that for conscious experience, for conscious human beings, a self is present? How are the different layers of the embodied, the emotional, and the thinking self connected to each other? How do they influence each other? I prepare some new answers in the second half of this book. This book, however, is not only about consciousness and self-consciousness. The yet deeper question behind the phenomenal appearance of a world and of a self is connected to the notion of a consciously experienced first-person perspective. What precisely makes consciousness a subjective phenomenon? This is the second half of my first epistemic target. The issue is not only how a phenomenal self per se can arise, but how beings like ourselves come to use this phenomenal self as a tool for experiencing themselves as subjects. We need interdisciplinary answers to questions like these. What does it mean that in conscious experience we're not only related to the world, but related to it as knowing selves? What exactly does it mean that a ph phenomenal self typically is not only present in an experiential reality, but at the same time it forms the center of this reality? How do we come to think and speak about ourselves as first persons? After first having developed in chapters two, three, and four some simple tools that help us understand how, more generally, a reality can appear, I proceed to tackle these questions from the second half of chapter six onward. More about the architecture of what follows in section 1.3.